I uh, I want you to take your copy of God's Word, if you have it this morning, and meet me in the book of Titus chapter 2, please. Titus chapter 2. We'll be there in just a moment. Since it's Mother's Day, I thought I would share a little story. I Perhaps I think as I look back on my records, I may have shared this back some years ago, but I think it's so wonderful little story, I thought I would share it with you today. I heard about three sons. They were raised by their, by their parents, but primarily by their mother. And uh, all three sons grew up to become very successful, and because they were so successful, they attributed much of what they had become to their mother. And so uh, it was a time in which they just wanted to honor mom, and so they did... Uh, decided on this particular day that all three of them would present their mother with a very special gift. So the first son, his name was Milton, and so Milton built his mom a huge house to live in, literally a palatial mansion, and it was filled with all the nice things. And the second son, his name was Joe, he brought his mother up to the top, uh, top of the line Mercedes and uh, hired a chauffeur to take her wherever she wanted to go. And finally, the third son, Donald, he, he was a little bit more spiritual, and so he decided he would buy his mother a remarkable parrot. And this parrot was uh, so remarkable that it had taken 12 years to teach his, this parrot to memorize the entire New Testament. You just gave it the passage, and the, the, the parrot would be able to, to say the passage, and so he presented that as his gift to the mother. So upon receiving these gifts, this elderly mother sat down and she wrote a note to each one of her sons. And so she said, Milton, thank you for the huge house. I realize you meant well, but this place is so big and I get lost in my own bathroom. I really only live in one or two rooms and yet I have to worry about the rest of the house, but thanks, Mom. Joe, I don't know what you were thinking. Buy me this expensive car. I have no desire to go anywhere at my age and the driver you hired is a bore and so rude. So thank you, Mother Dearest Donald, you've always been my favorite. You have such good sense, and you know what your mother likes. The chicken was delicious. Love, Mother. (laughs) Only a mom, right? Take your Bible, if you have it there, in Titus chapter 2. I was deciding what to preach this morning on this Mother's Day, and I, uh, we're not unfamiliar with the book of Titus, chapter 2. Specifically, we have a ministry here called Titus 2 that meets on a monthly basis, and it really is modeled after what is stated here in the book of Titus in chapter 2. But I, I want to speak this morning on this subject, every mother a teacher, every mother a teacher. And I want us to notice, please, what the Bible says here in verse number 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now Paul is writing to a a preacher by the name of Titus. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now he says, I'm going to direct these words, that the aged men, those that are older men, the men older in the faith, those who are older in age, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patient. Now he begins to direct his, his thoughts to this young preacher that he would direct them to the women of the congregation. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior that becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. I want us to take those thoughts this morning and, as I said, want to share this message that the Lord's laid upon my heart every mother a teacher. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for what we've enjoyed already here today, the opportunity that we have to congregate each Sunday is a blessing. Lord, I do pray that as we meet today that you would help us in this moment, specifically, Lord, as you've laid this message upon our heart. I pray, Lord, that you'd help me to deliver the intent of the text. Lord, not my thoughts, but your words. Help us, Lord, to be accurate in all that we do here today. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of a mom. And Lord, I pray for those today, perhaps, whose mothers have gone home to be with the Lord in heaven. Uh, Lord, perhaps there are some who have never really known their mother. Lord, I just ask that you would help comfort our hearts. Uh, I know probably there's some women in this room this morning who long to be a mother, but at this point have not been able to have children. Lord, there's some grieving hearts, no doubt, here today. So, Lord, would you do that work that only you can do through your blessed Holy Spirit? 
Lord, I, I pray that you would comfort. I pray that you'd encourage. And I pray most of all, Lord, you'd help us all. For we need your help today in this place. We are, make no apology for saying we are dependent upon you, Lord. We ask these things and we pray them in your name. Amen. Amen. So as so we look at this text this morning, we see the Apostle Paul and He's instructing, as I mentioned, a a younger preacher by the name of Titus to help some people who made up a church on the Isle of of Crete. Now, I did a little research. Crete is a fairly significant island. It it is named a a different name today. It's not known as Crete. But it was approximately 140 miles long and about 35 miles wide. It had a fairly, if you would, populous and prosperous island. It was fairly well inhabited. The people that lived there were fairly well-to-do. It was said that there were 100 cities on the Isle of Crete. So there were 100 cities that were on this island, which is pretty significant when you consider the size of the island, a fairly significant number of cities. Now, evidently, this island had a church, and Paul, of course, was there and had visited them. I don't know exactly. We're not given in the Bible. Many times we know from the book of Acts how a particular church got started. But evidently, this church was planted. It was there. Paul was visiting them, and he's brought with him this young preacher by the name of Titus. And we learned of Paul's purpose in leaving Titus there in chapter one in verse number five. I'll read it for you. If you want to turn back one chapter and look at it, that's fine. Paul says, for this cause, speaking to Titus, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. So here's, here's Paul saying, hey, hey, Titus, you're in Crete. Here's the reason I left you. There are things that are wanting. That word set in order means it's a medical term. It's like setting a crooked limb or a broken limb. You would set it. You would put it in order. And so Paul is saying to Titus, here's the reason I left you here. There's some things that need to be set in order. And, and there are cities here that need pastors of their churches. And so I want you to ordain elders. It's significant that as you get to the end of chapter one, he gives the qualifications for those who would would be a pastor of a church. And so he says, here's the reason I left you, and here's the qualifications of the men that you're looking for. So we must remember at this point, this church, in church history, the New Testament wasn't complete. So we said here today, we have 27 books that make up the New Testament. We must remember that when Paul is writing to Titus, he's writing an epistle, or one of the pastoral epistles that will be part of our Bible, but at that point, there was really not a finished work of the New Testament. So these, this work of the apostle, this work of teaching and instructing these congregations were so very necessary. So while they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they still needed to be instructed. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You, if you're a young Christian, you need instruction. If you're an older Christian, you still need instruction. We all, we never get to the point where we really arrive in the Christian faith. We're still growing. Did you know the process of sanctification is an ongoing process until the day the Lord takes you home? Uh, in other words, we should still be developing. We should still be coming more and more like Jesus Christ. I don't know if you ever look at yourself like I do in the mirror and don't like what I look at. Don't laugh. I'm not talking about the physical side, all right? I'm just simply saying sometimes when I look in the mirror of God's word, I don't like what I see and it says about me. And so I'm saying that, hey, this was a church that needed some help. Paul left this preacher here and says, hey, here's what you need to teach them. Here's what you need to instruct them. I want you to know that this, this, this group of people, this island, these people who were known as Cretans, they had a, they had a reputation Look if you would at chapter 1, look at verses 12 and 13. Notice what Paul says about the Cretans. He said, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Do you know what that means? It means they're lazy. This witness, he says, is true. In other words, Paul said, hey, I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. Hey, this guy said the truth when he said they're liars. They're evil beasts. They're slow bellies. So uh, he said, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Someone said this about the Cretans. One of the uh, commentaries I went to said, quote, in common speech, the expression to, to Cretanize signify to tell lies which helped to account for the detestable character which the apostle had given of the Cretans. So in other words, they even came up with a term to Cretanize meant you are a liar. You're, you're, you're Cretanizing. You're, you're lying just like the Cretans. So you say, preacher, what's the point? 
So the character and reputation of these people who lived in Crete was well known. So much so that even the world recognized their low character. So amongst, think, think about this. This is pagan first century Rome and the Roman Empire. Not exactly high level of integrity or character. And yet they look at the Cretans as being at a lower level. This is, this is the world saying, hey, these people, they got some problems. This culture has some issues. So how do you, how do you change the culture? How do you change the, cult, the, the, the conduct and impact the character of such people? In other words, what's the answer? When you have a, a low level of, of character, when you are known as liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, the world even says that of you, how do you change that character? One answer, the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes people. I love 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Wow, that's good stuff. That's the word of God. It's powerful. God can change us. God can make us new. He can give us a new beginning. You may be struggling here today. You look at your life and say, but preacher, I, I'm, not, I'm like you. I don't like what I look at in the mirror. I'm just telling you that everything I try fails. I seem to, I seem to be, my life is in disarray. How do I change it? I, I tell you, if you're not saved, you need to get saved today. Let Jesus Christ come into your life. Let the Holy Spirit of God take up residence inside of you, and he will change you. But by the way, you have to have a little patience with yourself. Because as I said, it's a incremental change. It's a while he changes us instantly, while our standing in Christ is instantly changed but the day that we get saved. Boy, don't you love it? One day you're lost, you're on your way to hell, you're a child of the devil. The moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are now saved, you are in Jesus Christ, you are on your way to heaven. You are a child, a son of God. Instantly, that quickly. But there's a little bit of distance from this point to this point, practically speaking, because God has to change us a little bit at a time, and he's at work in our life. So, as we think about this, that work begins, that teaching begins, and these truths and doctrines come from God. They need to be a part of our lives, and the Holy Spirit takes these truths and convicts. So, Paul's purpose in leaving Titus here at Crete was to help this congregation to grow in grace and knowledge. We say this, this is so true, belief determines behavior. Let's say that together. Belief determines behavior. So I can tell what a person believes if I watch their behavior. See, you can tell me that you're a Christian, but it's your life that'll tell me if you're a Christian. Your life is telling. Now, now look, we all have perhaps moments when we lapse and somebody look at us and say, I thought they were a Christian. That should really not be the, the common aspect of our life. In other words, the, the conduct, the, the way I conduct my life, people ought to look at me and say, hey, his testimony, the way he lives, is consistent with his testimony of his words. If my life on a regular basis is not consistent with my testimony, my words, in other words, I, I'm not living out my faith, then I better look at myself and say, hey, there's something wrong here. Either I'm not really saved or I'm really out of line with God, and I need to get my life back in line with God. So our belief determines our behavior, and so it's important that we have proper teaching. So in our text, we find Paul instructs Titus first to instruct the aged men. So ladies, I want you to understand that why we're not neglecting the men today, they're number one on the list here. But it is Mother's Day. So we're going to kind of bypass verse number two and move to verse three through five, because it is Mother's Day. And, and so in these verses, we see that the aged women are to instruct the younger women in the church in regard to their conduct. You know, we are in a generation, and, and, and if you are of this generation, I, I'm not trying to be offensive, but I've been around the block a few times, all right? When you get to my age, you get the right to say some things, not necessarily trying to be offensive, but just stating the truth, and I'm trying to say, say, state the truth in love. Amen. We're in a, at a generation today of young folks that are coming up that you can't tell them anything. Amen. In other words, they already know everything. And if they don't know it, they can Google it. <laughs> or they'll ask Alexa or Siri because, you know, they have all the answers, you know. But can I tell you there are some things in life that Google isn't going to be able to answer? 
there are some things in life that Siri isn't able to answer. And I'm just saying this, say, say to you today that there are some things that the Word of God does answer. And, and probably Google doesn't respect, in fact, I know they don't respect the Word of God. And so as a result of that, God says, hey, look, I've got a, I've got a plan here. And the plan is that in my people, among my people, among the church, that the older women have a responsibility to teach the younger women some things. They have a responsibility to do this teaching within the realm of the church. And so as I, I think about that, I want you ladies to see that every mother is a teacher. I want you to see that every mother, by the way, I think every woman is a teacher. But, but we're specifically speaking, I think, here in the realm of what Paul is saying to Titus. Hey, I want the older women who've, who've lived the life, who've, who've been married, who've had children, I want them to teach the younger women who are, who are now being married or, and now are bearing children. I want them to teach them some things. So I, I want to point out just a couple of things, and, and then I'm going to just make a couple of applications we'll be through this morning. And our time, by the way, is slipping away very quickly, so you know that I'm going to have to put the pedal to the metal today to get finished. Notice, if you would, first of all, the statement. Now, notice what he says in verse number one. This is, we're, 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 this is really precipitates all that he's going to say in the next couple of verses. But notice what he says in verse number one. Titus, so when he says the word but, he's, he's saying, okay, now I'm going to add to what I've just said. Titus, I want you to speak those things which become sound doctrine. So some things, think about this. Here, here's the statement. Some things are taught. Some things that we teach enhance the doctrine or the teaching of the Bible. That's what he says in verse number one. Some, some things that we teach, that when people catch them and they live them, they enhance the teaching of the Bible. Paul's instruction to Titus is that what he is about to share are to be taught because they become sound doctrine. In chapter one, Paul spoke to the fact that there were some of the circumcision that were teaching things that weren't good. Uh, when we think of circumcision, that those would be those who were, who were Jewish or who were Hebrews, some of them who, who perhaps said, hey, you know, we're still part of Judaism, but he says they're, they're teaching some things that aren't good. Look, if you would, back in chapter 1. In my Bible, I don't even have to turn the page. You may not have to in yours, but look at verses 10 and 11. Notice he says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So he's saying, hey, hey, there's some of this circumcision who are teaching things that are not helpful to what's going on in the home. Amen. Did you know there's some teaching in this world today that's not helpful to your home? Amen. There's some teaching that it will pit a husband against his wife or a wife against her husband. Amen. And I'm telling you, there's some teaching out there that's subversive. It, it, it's undermining, if you would, of the home and the family structure the way that God wants it to be. And so he said, hey, there, that's out there, Titus. It's out there. It's in this world. Amen. Look at verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. That's just what I said a moment ago. In other words, say, here's my testimony. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I know God. But my conduct says, I don't know God. Verse 16, they profess they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and to other, in every good work, reprobate. In case you're not aware, the word reprobate is not a good word. Amen. It's a pretty nasty word. It means that God says, hey, look, you, are, I, you, you have a mind that, that has been turned over to the devil. That's what the word reprobate means. And so he's saying, look, they're, 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 they're such that they have become reprobates. Now notice what is, that is now contrasted to what Paul instructs Titus. So we get to verse number um, 16. Then we come to verse number 1. See the word but? That's the conjunction. It, it joins what he just said in verse 16 to chapter 2, verse number 1. So you got those over here who say they know God, but by works deny him, every work are reprobate. They're, they're, they're reprobates, but you. Speak thou those things which become sound doctrine. What you teach, what you teach should, doesn't hurt people. It's designed to help people. The idea of becoming sound doctrine means it makes it so people can see the truth and they can't argue with it because they see the reality of it. That's what he's saying. Timothy... Or Titus, teach this stuff, 
it's going to help these people because they're going to be able to see it. Now, now let me use this illustration. There are some things, there are some ways of living that really tell people what you have is credible. In other words, we all know that there are some things that are really not in alignment with what we would say is to be our position. Let, let me draw it down to maybe where we live. Most of us, some, some folks, our family's planning on going out to eat today because it's Mother's Day and I don't want my wife to have to cook. So our plan is to go out. Let's say that we, the, the restaurant we choose, we walk in and in that restaurant, it is open for business, but as I look around, I'm, I'm looking at the, the plate perhaps or the cup that they bring to my table that's to put water in and it, it's got lipstick on it. And the utensils are dirty that are set there. They're wrapped in the napkin, but I mean, they're just, you can tell that, hey, somebody didn't really take a lot of care in washing this stuff. When they bring the food out, there's little stuff crawling around in it. <laughs> now, I think most of us would say, mm, I'm sorry. This is a restaurant, but I don't think I'm coming back here. Why? Because it's not consistent with where we want to be as a people. We want to go someplace that's clean, wholesome, where people give attention to detail, right? That, that's what we want. And so Paul is saying, hey, Titus, there is a way that people ought to live that enhance or becomes what they believe. In other words, they can say it, but people can see it, and they can't argue with it because it's becoming of sound doctrine. So that's the uh, statement. But notice, if you would, that the conduct of aged women is mentioned here in verse number three, that this is the conduct that should help the, the, the aspect. That aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior, in other words, they're living, as becometh holiness. And now he lists the two things right here that are, are somewhat negative that should not be a part of any Christian's life, specifically those who have walked with Christ for a while. He says in verse number two, uh, or verse number three, th that becometh holy, they're not false accusers. In other words, they're not act, accusing people, just slandering people and accusing them falsely. That should not be a part of any person's life. And then notice, not given to much wine. In other words, they're not drunkards. They're just, they abstain from, from, from things that would, would cause that type of thing. And so, so here's someone who's walked with Christ for a while. They've lived the faith. So what he's saying is holy women aren't involved in this kind of conduct. And because they aren't, it gives them a credible platform from which to speak. Now notice he now moves from the conduct. Now he moves to the charge. Look at verse, the rest of verse number three all the way to verse number five. So while they're not giving them much wine, they should be teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So these aged women in the church are now to help the younger women say, okay, I can see the credibility in your life because you're, you're not doing these things. But here's the things that I, they're teaching that now the younger women say, okay, I can get, grab a hold of that because I see the credibility in your life. Now, let's move to the second thought very quickly this morning. Would you notice the implication, the implication? Well, the first thing I would say that is implied in this text is, first of all, there is a need of younger women to be instructed. Amen. Hello? <laughs> You don't tell older women to teach younger women unless there's a need, right? So there's a need. There's an implication here. Hey, the younger women need to be instructed. So, be, so think about this. These are women who have been living in a godless, pagan culture. So Creed is not known as a, a citadel of morality. It's not known as a citadel of high character. So now these women are saved. These women have walked with Christ for a while. They're saved. They've got this platform. Now they can reach down and help the younger women to get a hold of some things because it's necessary, uh, because the culture is so low. Amen. Think about this. With the feminist movement in the last several decades, women who are, who are focused on being a wife and a mother in some respects feel like they're wasting their time. That's been some of, of the impression that's been given that you can only make a, a mark on society if you go out and, and make high achievement out in the work world. 
hey, hey, look, I'm not opposed to women working, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But can I say to you, if you're a wife and a mother, your primary focus is not your job or your career. It is your family. It is what God has given you. That is your primary focus. So we're living in a culture today that when women in the world get saved, listen, they need some instruction. Moms who have walked with God for years need to see these young women coming in the church and they need to say, hey, look, let me help you understand some things from the word of God. And because you have this, this, this standard or this, this life or this platform that they can see the credibility in your life, it makes it easier for them to listen to you. Amen. So there's a need. The second implication is that this teaching would have a positive impact physically and spiritually. Let me give you two things. These younger women would catch this truth and greatly impact their families and in turn would impact the world. You say, preacher, how so? Well, let's simply say this. So 2,000 years ago, here's Paul writing to Titus. Titus, hey, there's a need of the older women in the church to instruct the younger women in the church so that they can go home and you be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, lovers of their own husbands, raising their children in the faith, and that's necessary. So here we are 2,000 years later, and we still have women doing that. What I'm saying is, hey, hey, what Paul gave to Timothy was life-changing. It was world-changing. It, is in, it impacts the world today. And so ladies, look, look, you may be at home today and you say, you know, I, I purposely have just chosen not to work for a while or I'm just purposely choosing to really put my focus on my family and raising my kids. I want to get God into their hearts and into their lives. And, and I'm asking some of the older women in the church to give me some help and help mentor me in, in some of these things. And, and, and you say, you know, sometimes it feels like I'm losing this battle and not winning this battle. And sometimes I feel like I'm pulling my hair out because I don't think these kids are ever going to get out of diapers. And they're, they're never not going to be hungry. And, and they're always going to want more milk. And they're always going to want more things. And how am I ever going to get beyond this? Guess what? They grow up. Amen. They do graduate from high school. Amen. They do graduate from college. And then they start that cycle all over again. They marry and have children. And you get to help them with their rugrats. <laughs> One of the joys of my wife and I is the fact that we didn't kill our sons as they were growing up. <laughs> they now are married to wonderful women who have given us 10 wonderful grandchildren. And I rejoice as I watch them go through some of the same struggles I went through. <laughs> but we're here to help. Because my wife is a teacher. And my daughter-in-laws are teachers. And every mother is a teacher. You don't have to be in a classroom. You're in the classroom of life. And you want to get good things in the heart of your kids. I stand where I stand today, number one, because I'm saved, number two, because I'm called of God, but number three, because I had godly parents who got some things in my heart. Some of you are first century, you're first Christian, first, you're the first ones in your family to really know Christ. You don't have the luxury of having been raised by godly parents who love the Lord and brought you to church and taught you things, but you could do that in your family. Hey, mama, don't give up. Hey, mama. Don't surrender to the world. Amen. Keep the faith. Amen. Put it into the hearts and lives of these younger kids. If you're struggling, find one of these gray-haired saints that you know has walked with God. And you go to them and say, can you help me? Because I'm struggling. Hey, gray-haired saint, find you one of these young families here in this church. Walk up to them and put your arm around them and say, hey, we just want to let you know, we're not here to hurt you, we're here to help you. Any way that we can, we want to be a blessing to you. And that may mean at some point you say, hey, bring your kids over. We want to sit down, we want to have a meal with you. Hey, hey, bring your kids over. You guys need to go out on a date night. Bring your kids over, we'll watch them for a while. I'm just simply saying, these type of things, what Paul told Titus here, it doesn't hurt anybody, it helps everybody. Amen. We're living in a world that wants to destroy what God wants to build. Amen. So we have to build what God wants to build. Amen. And we have to do it based upon the the Bible. So that's my message to you today. You're a teacher. You may not feel like a teacher. You, you may say, I, I've told that child a hundred times to pick up their toys. 
I still tell, look, I still have to tell them to pick up their toys. One of these days, you're going to look around and the toys are going to be picked up. They may be in high school, but they're going to be picked up, all right? Amen. Or maybe they're in college, or maybe they're married and the toys are picked up. I don't know. But the truth of the matter is, don't give up. But you've got to live it before you can teach it. That's the platform. That's what Paul told Titus here. Titus, you take those people who've been part of this culture, God has saved them. You're now instructing them. Help them to teach these young women because they need that in this culture. Can I tell you that we're living in a godless pagan culture today in America? This is not the America that I grew up in in 1950. It has changed. And while some of the change maybe isn't necessarily all bad, a whole lot of it's not really healthy for families and for those who are trying to raise their kids. Amen. Specifically those who want to get the things of God into their hearts. And you can't do it by yourself. It takes God in you and the Holy Spirit of God working through you. God's word is still powerful. It is still true 2,000 years later after Paul wrote to young Titus. He said, you help those folks. You help them understand that, hey, there is, a, there is a behavior that becomes sound doctrine. May God help us to get that today.